So I see some faces that managed to get up this morning, uh, so that's a very positive sign. So, so welcome to this uh, uh, session. Um, so my name is Joost Geurts. I work uh, in the ADRA E uh, project, so this is the coordination and support action that supports ADRA and um, the, the, the AI Data Robotics uh, uh, Partnership. Um, so, uh, so this session was organized with, with, with CTAC, one of our, 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 our members that is especially active in, in automotive uh, and in this context uses data, AI and robotics, which is also the theme of this, uh, this session. Uh, should have this. So first, I'd, I'd, I'd like to make a statement. So, uh, so we, we are strong supporters of, 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 of gender balance, but uh, yeah, so we, we regret very much that we didn't manage to implement this uh, ourselves, and we didn't want to get by this uh, unnoticed. So this is, uh, yeah, so sort of a mea culpa. Uh, anyway, so cross-community convergence boards, but to, to bootstrap uh, ADRA. So this is what we are going to do uh, today. ADRA is something that we built uh, together, and one important component of this is, is uh, getting the communities together. People that maybe not used. Uh, aren't used to work together in, 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 in a similar way. Uh, and in this session, we're going to explore how tools and, and, and platforms and maybe even projects uh, can be a facilitator in, in creating this uh, uh, convergence. So we consider automotive to be yeah, may, maybe one of an, uh, of an ideal uh, scenario for that because it's clearly related to AI data and, uh, and robotics. So maybe there are some things to learn from this domain uh, as well, and these are some of the questions we will also be uh, addressing. So the, the, the agenda for today uh, is to give a little bit of context about what ADRA is and what the partnership uh, is about. So this will be done by one of the ADRA directors, uh, uh, Kai. And then we have a question and answer sessions with, with you guys uh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, any question that you can think of and that you'd like to have, have answers, that, uh, that, you, that we have some time for that. Uh, so then we go into the presentation. So we have four of them. Um, and, 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 and we finalize with the panel discussion uh, that is also moderated by Kai. OK, so I think we're all ready to go. Uh, so Kai, I'll give you the floor. Okay. Good morning to everybody. Uh, nice also from my part to see that <laughs> some faces here. Uh, I'm uh, Kai Södergård. I'm uh, a vice president in, in ADRA. I was also for many years in the BDVA board. And, uh, and uh, before ADRA, I was uh, for many years uh, working as a research professor at VTT. Technical Research Center, so many years that I still are talking about we us when we're talking about VDT. So uh, uh, I will uh, shortly discuss uh, a bit about the partnership uh, and, uh, and the association, which are the objectives, uh, also try a bit to to motivate you, those of you that have not joined yet the association, and uh, and uh, a bit about the approach that ADRA has and the how it's governed, and uh, and the membership, how, where we stay now and uh, and benefits. So uh, so the partnership is uh, was uh, signed about one year ago be between the Commission and. Uh, associate on the ADRA and uh, uh, that means that that uh, the ADRA is uh, a, a part of the of the of a cooperation with the co commission and uh, so the commission is obliged to listen to to our views so so ADRA is the private side of the of the of this partnership where the commission represents the public Part of course, the IRTOs like my BDT, TNO, and so on is is important members in ADRA also. But it's industry driven and gives the voice of the how the industry sees what should be should be uh, uh, research in in, uh, in Europe and uh, and uh, there is a lot to be researched here. For it's 1.3 billion 
euro that uh, that the Commission has uh, committed themselves to, to spend in this area during this decade, and and uh, and that will be matched by by the private side uh, with as much. And th this means about 200 projects, of which 42, the first 42 projects are already launched. So so it's a big uh, it's a big uh, investment, and. Uh, so the ADRA is set up by, as, as seen from the name, by, by, the A, by three AI association, Claire, Ellis, and Eura AI, and then BDVA, of course, for representing the data perspective, and then Eur Robotics, the ro uh, that, that, uh, from the robotics side, and the BDVA, uh, the robotics, they have long traditions, are, and uh, that doesn't, of course, mean that the, that ADRA in, a way, in any way is replacing these ones. They are, they are running and very successfully, as we have seen at this, at, uh, at this EBDF uh, as, uh, as before. But that now here, when we are talking about the convergence between the AI data and, and, and robotics, then ADRA has a role, and uh, and the. the the overarching objectives are, of course, uh, high level. It's, it's what Europe, Europe wants to be in this sector. They, we want to be, to be sovereign, to, in a way, lead the AI development towards, uh, according to the European values, uh, when we are talking to the, about the impact. And also to be, to, to, to Grant that U Europe is competitive. In, uh, so they are big. <laughs> China, US, and so on are, are strong competitors in this field, of course, as you know. And uh, there is a lot of challenges if we are, uh, for example, uh, looking at, um, at, at the, how much uh, big data is now used by the, by the companies. It's about 25% now of the companies is using big data. At the end of the decade, it should be 75%, um, according to the to the digital decade uh, targets. And and for AI, it's a bit better. We are now uh, uh, close to 40%. But again, it's it's a, a long way to go to be in, to 75% of the comp enterprises in Europe. And Adra has a role of course, here, to be, make this possible. And, uh, and it's, um, the politicians are, has uh, also, in a, way, in a way, waked up to see the seriousness of the situation. So if, if the Europe will lag in, in AI, then it, and it means that the standards are, are formed outside Europe, and that, that, uh, that is a risk even, as, as the, the European Parliament here claimed, claim it's a risk for the political stability and, of course, for the competitiveness. Uh, so it's, we are in, in for, serious, uh, for a serious task here. And, um, and that the global Challenges has been set by by the United Nations, for example. You know certainly the, uh, these sustainable development goals. The Commission has their, their missions that should be uh, implemented during this decade, and uh, and uh, here we, we see a role for this uh, kind of organisation like ADRA that joins. AI data and, and robotics. For example, uh, if, uh, if uh, one mission is uh, relating to the oceans, and if you really we are in for cleaning the oceans from the pollution from the plastic, uh, then you need. Uh, it's not enough enough to have to be very to have the data and to have the algorithms. You also have to have the manipulators, the robotics, the uh, ro robots that are, that are doing it. So it's a uh, and, and the same, of course, is the topic for this session, the, the self and safe and autonomous, autonomous driving, smart agriculture, where you need robot, robot tractors and so on. And uh, so it, really the, the big challenge is needs that we put together these technologies. And um, 
So that is in a way the value proposition that we 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 claim to have. So so it's uh, if you join uh, Adra, you will become involved in this in a way driving the future towards uh, being a part in, in solving these uh, big challenges and uh, by leveraging on the convergence. And we claim to be unique in this uh, respect. It's the only association that, that gives that possibility in Europe. And, uh, and, uh, it, it's, and that makes it possible to formulate, uh, formulate long-term research and innovation objectives, uh, both on, in companies in the, in the strategy formulation and in, in uh, research organizations and, and, uh, and, and universities. Uh, just to, to a bit to go below the, the, the titles here, uh, as I said, the first 42 projects have been launched. And just to give a flavor of, of what, uh, what are the, have been the calls there, the, it's trustworthy AI, it's biases in AI, the green, day, green Deal, how to advance that, and, uh, and uh, at work related, workplaces related uh, topics and, uh, and robot cogni cognition. Uh, so, uh, we try to build, of course, on, on the existing strengths in, in Europe and, and to be open and, uh, and have a broad dialogue, of which this is a part. And uh, also to, to safeguard a, a balance between now the different constituencies that, that we have five of those uh, founding, that we're founding ADRA, and, and uh, the balance is in, in a way reflected in the composition of the board. So it should be always robotics in there, it should always be AI in there, it should always be data in there. It, it has, uh, so that's the balance, and uh, it should be industry and, and research and different kind of, of, of actors. And uh, so that's um, the approach. And, and the, it's governed very much in the, in the typical way. So the, the, the highest authority is the General Assembly. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, the board, as I said, it's, it's in a way a, a matrix of the disciplines here and the industry and, and research. And, uh, uh, and the President and Secretary General has been, uh, we have had a, a fairly long process to find a good Secretary General. Now we have uh, we had 40 applicants and uh, five is now in the final. Uh, final for that, so uh, so it should be. Uh, we should have a, as we think, a very competent se secretary in general at the end of this year. And the and the what we are heading for now is the first uh, re general assembly that uh, will elect the board. This uh, founding board that we have now that was in a way set up by the founding or these five founding or organization now. Uh, next year, uh, in the best case, already in February, we will have the first uh, uh, general assembly that elects uh, the new board. And, uh, and uh, in that way, if you are not a, a member of OADRA yet, it then starts to be a, a, a bit time to, to join. Uh, uh, in the best case, already, say, before, within some weeks if you want to be be represented and, and uh, in impact on the on, on the on the next board or sitting in it and uh, so here is the it's a, it's a big it's a big uh, board now we are 18 uh, and uh, six from from all of the uh, from each constituency it's headed by marina bill from abb and you can see um, here we have, uh, I don't know if Laura is still here, but we, we have uh, Thomas here and uh, Christophe. You are, you are ready to uh, answer the questions. And, um, and this, and um, if you look at the members, uh, we have now 46 members uh, from, uh, 
from, uh, and we especially need more industrial members. And uh, you can see here, here also at, that uh, we have uh, uh, al almost half of these are, are members in, in BDVA. So BDVA is well represented in the membership. And, and uh, from already uh, fairly many European countries. And uh, I see that the typical, uh, I think the, these fees for being a member, annual fees are, f are t fairly typical like for this kind of associations. And it's worth to note that if you are already a member of BDVA, for example, then you can get um, almost uh, typically a, ha a reduction with 50% reduction, so you pay half of, the, of this price. And uh, so, a bit to repeat, so if you are a, mem uh, uh, a member, you have a, a large access to, to, the, uh, to the stakeholders, and uh, you can impact on the research program, uh, but because, as I said, the commission is, uh, has to consider what we are saying, and, uh, and we are taking part, for example, now, currently in the preparation of the, of the work program, 25-27 and have joint pro uh, groups with the, the Commission there. And, uh, and also we are renewing the, the, st the strategic research innovation de and deployment, SRIDA agenda. And uh, we have one, but that is already two years old, and now we will uh, renew it. And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, several Topics group in policy making, uh, standardization, of course, in, in addition to the in more internal ones in re regulation and, and uh, communication marketing. And, and uh, as, a, as a member, you can propose, of course, new ones. And we will also have common uh, topic group with the founding organization, like with BDVA. For example, in standardization, that, that's one where we have, uh, have a, a common where also robotics is, is involved. So um, that was that was uh, my presentation, and, and we are present on the on the web here, and you can see also there which which are the members and uh, and in the social media and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kai. Uh, so so. I'd like to introduce uh, Th Thomas Hahn. Uh, so Kai already uh, introduced him slowly. So Thomas is also a, a, a board director uh, at uh, ADRA, even a vice president for industry and, 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 and data. And we also have here with us uh, Christophe Leroux, who is uh, uh, the vice president for uh, robotics and, and, and research. So we're very happy to have them here. And so now it's up to you to uh, ask any question you would like to about uh, about ARA, so please. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Anyone that? Otherwise, I can start with the question. We we often receive uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in ADRA, and it is, okay, if, if I am a member of one of the founding organizations, um, am I also a member of, 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 of ADRA? And if, if not, so what is the difference uh, between the, 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 the two? Or what is the, why should I join one of them? Anyone likes to volunteer? Okay. <coughs> so, um, so it's not automatic to become a member when you're a member of uh, one of the funding organization, but you have uh, some some facilities, some um, uh, to to, and especially for the 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 fees, which are um, uh, smaller if you if you're a part of already of one of the funding organization. Now, uh, why why should we be part of ADRA? Uh, since we are part of uh, BGVA, Claire, Ellis, or any other organization, it's because uh, ADRA is is the main contact point now for the 
European Commission to elaborate this uh, uh, research program, which is, you've seen is a, has a, a very, very important budget on AI, robotics, big data. And uh, so the, the ADRA Association is, uh, of course, relying on the uh, skills and uh, resources available in different uh, funding organizations. But uh, you see, you can have find your interest in being part of these uh, specificities, like a PDVA would be specialized on uh, big data people and regrouping the people having this interest. And uh, uh, ADRA would be the main uh, way to communicate with the European Commission. I don't know if you have to, something to... I think you, you put it very well, and, and as you have heard at this seminar, it's, uh, this work uh, conference, uh, the, the, com the representatives from the Commission, they have urged you <laughs> in, in, in many, even in the first day and, and so on, to, to join. So, so it's really something that the, the Commission want, want that ADRA will be, be successful. Yeah, maybe because I'm also representing industry um, here and around. Um, let's see, for me, it's the most important thing the content. Um, um, request from commissions, okay. Um, uh, BC contact point, uh, also okay. But I'm really a fan to look what content can ATRA provide. And it can provide content. Um, because you know, uh, and I give you a kinosis, your stenosis. Uh, when you're speaking about AI, data, and robotics, and as you know, um, we as a company, we are a member of BDVA Euro Robotics. One of my colleagues is a, a, a fellow or elected member from, from Alice, uh, Claire, Euro AI. I don't think that we are a member as a company, um, uh, but nevertheless, we are covering the topic. But exactly what is in between. Uh, this is what uh, Arthur has to focus uh, on. And I think this is um, uh, so one topic, and uh, you know, um, I have the, um, uh, you mentioned standardization, you're right, um, with um, um, uh, new machine regulations, for example, where you have the, uh, the topic regarding data, AI, AI changing the machine, as I'm not the expert in machine regulation, I have to uh, tell you, uh, but here this was exactly what the standardization working group, which we make jointly uh, uh, together. What ATRA has uh, really to look at, um, really in um, leveraging uh, on, on existing uh, capabilities, I phrase it in this with capabilities making um, uh, work groups uh, or something else. Also I'm really, you know, uh, this has ATRA to achieve, uh, exactly to, to covering the, the gaps, uh, because at the end, um, uh, uh, you know, give another example when you're speaking about explainable AI, we would really like uh, uh, to have uh, the necessary input uh, from the uh, AI research communities. Uh, you bring it together with the data and the industrial AI community, you know, PDVA is somehow covering both. Uh, and this is a topic, I gave him one example regarding robotics, machine regulations, um, and one example more regarding data and AI, and the need for uh, AI research. Just maybe you <coughs> can ask, uh, we can add also that uh, why, why would the Commission wanted to have these uh, uh, three disciplines um, uh, to gather these three disciplines in uh, together uh, and design um, a, a research program. Uh, the, the main reason is the the competition with uh, with uh, Asia, with uh, um, uh, other countries, other with United States, of course. And uh, the, the the origin was also uh, to have a leveraging effect and uh, maintain European leadership in our research. And uh, industry, <clears throat> and uh, through this combination of the three disciplines, to find some, to, to create some new vision, new understanding of research that could create some some uh, new perspective for for European industry and research. Maybe you should open. Yep. So, any question from the audience? Yeah. <coughs> 
So you, you said that the European Commission is listening to you, that's uh, good to hear, but concretely, so I'm a newbie in these uh, <laughs> things, uh, concretely how this is uh, happening? Uh, do you have some meeting points? Do you have, um, yeah, I would like to do more about yeah, this. Now, uh, in the setup phase of, uh, of ADRA, that has now lasted for about one year, so, so the, uh, the board has been very, they are working a lot. It's not like we are we are meeting and the the board and the vice presidents are meeting every week. We have a meeting every Monday, and and uh, and that uh, in that context in the context of that meeting we will we have a half an hour to one hour with the commi uh, commission uh, representatives like uh, like Kim Rossi for example, Evangelica. And, uh, and uh, so they are lis uh, and listening. So that's uh, in a way the really concrete thing. And then we are uh, uh, we got we get several in one month several requests. I I could claim at least one request. Some, some months several requests to to re uh, to give our uh, stand uh, standpoints on on. Uh, uh, Different questions that that they they want that commission is is driving, and then it is the the work program. That's of course uh, ex what I showed the 42 project. What and th these are the first two, but then f the first round, and now it has been a second round that went uh, deadline was uh, last week, but then they are coming several during this decade, and uh, and uh, so we are. We have a, a task group that is working with uh, with how ADRA sees what should be in the work program. And that, that is something that go, now goes on for for more than one year. It's different phases. So it, here are some examples of the very concrete things every week, and then the the more long-term impact on the work programs. But if you want to, or Jost, you, you can also answer because you are very central. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so I mean, there's of course the, the the work program that is a very important part. So I mean, we just finished uh, the the one on 23, 24, and we are starting now the the, the next one, so 25 and 26, and then uh, 27. So there will be a strategic paper that we're currently working on to set out what uh, what this will will look like. And then also, I mean, the commission, I mean, there's the, the, the work program where we are a primary uh, c contact point, but also for policy uh, question and when they need a, 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 an expert view on a particular topic, they also come to us and say, OK, give our feedback to the documents, uh, document they are pr pr preparing. So uh, that's uh, t t two sides of it. And, and then maybe one addition is, is it's maybe not directly the commission, but but uh, the, all, all of, of the projects that will be about 200. They are asked in the call text really to to relate to ADRA. So so the commission wants them to have, for example, one task in the project uh, that should, that will will keep, where, where contact will keep, be kept to ADRA. So it so that will of course. As, as the number of projects grows, that will uh, make the ADRA more and more central, because there are several, maybe a thousand researchers within those projects. Okay. Jarek Kowalski, Poland. Uh, I have actually two questions, right? One question is about the global economy. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are several global players, Siemens, ABB are global players, right? But on the other hand, we have a global players headquartered in, in Asia, in the United States. Uh, is ADRA open for collaboration with such uh, companies and open for membership for these companies first? Question and the other question is about the the funding tool from European Commission, right? This is Horizon Europe, which is purely research and innovation. What about the implementation projects and deployments like the, the project uh, programs like Digital Europe, right? Thank you. <coughs> Maybe I give an, 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 an try. I have not uh, the articles of the association of ATRA completely in my mind, uh, <laughs> um, but I'm also in, in, a, in, a, in a other context. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have discussed uh, this how uh, we we are we, we acting with um, uh, uh, European and non-European uh, players. Let's phrase it in, in, in this way. 
uh, first of all, when you are an organization um, um, uh, about um, and uh, in any way uh, are in context defining something, you can name it standard, standard setting organization, then um, you, you have to fulfill the antitrust law, meaning membership must be open. That was a big discussion, I can tell you, which we have had in GAIX, uh, no secret about. Uh, but it's antitrust law. By the way, uh, as a global company, <laughs> I want not to be confronted in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the US. Uh, okay, China's maybe a little bit different. Uh, or in South Korea, maybe as an example, or Japan, uh, facing an, an, um, uh, this discussion because we have, you know, uh, also the, the global business. But this is antitrust law, so it's, uh, this is open. And uh, what I know, and this was my comment, um, um, uh, that I have not completely the articles of association from Atra in my mind, I think for the um, 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 board of directors, I think we have, there's also no limitation, I think. Um, um, in ways there's also no, no limitation, because then we are um, uh, looking about the, you know, about the yeah, the members uh, who want to, uh, 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 yeah, to be voted or to be elected uh, as, a, as a board member. Um, for sure, we have some criteria. Uh, if somebody has to become a member, you know, um, and I've, in this case, I have to look to Joost, at least they have to have some kind of uh, research development uh, capabilities in Europe. I think uh, that is needed, also you cannot come from, don't ask me, uh, uh, New Zealand, have only New Zealand uh, uh, research and now you are applying for, mm, that's one issue, but this is uh, in line um, 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 uh, with the law. Uh, and the sec second issue, but this is obvious, you, uh, you have to be a, a legal company, you have not to make some illegal works, you know, this, this, this is typical stuff. I hope this answers uh, your, your question, also open to, to, to members and uh, also the, um, the voting for board members, which is in one or other association different. Guy X, for example, uh, they have implemented the rule uh, to have only headquartered European companies to be elected to the board. Uh, with a slightly different uh, uh, flavor. Um, uh, we can ask, uh, is this good or bad uh, during the coffee break? Um, uh, but uh, for members, it's open at least when the members are a legal entity, have some kind of development research yeah, capabilities in, in Europe and are not a uh, criminal organization, let's phrase it in this way. And so there was a and second part to the question, say, okay, uh, the partnership is in particular built uh, in, in uh, relation to Horizon Europe, so the research and innovation program, but there are also many deployment issues to tackle within mm. uh, European AI data and robotics. So does ADRA and the ADR partnership also relate to this? Or yeah, 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 I think uh, it, uh, it's primarily the, the Horizon Europe because that's, uh, in a way, uh, this is, these uh, public-private partnerships are a part of, of, the, of, the, or, uh, of the Horizon Europe program. And uh, it's, uh, but, but, uh, I think, for example, the EDISH uh, that, uh, that are now around Europe, and we found it in the Digital Europe program that is clo closer to the deployment. That, that uh, as ADRA now, now develops, I think that, uh, that there will be many links to, to those activities. It has to be. And, uh, and of course, through the members, uh, if I talk for VTT, for example, so we, we are. We are in in in, in the in, uh, in in the Finnish e e dish, and, and you are C A R and, and so on. So 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 uh, through the members, of course, there will be many links to those. So maybe you can add one small thing uh, in addition. So I mean the the the, the contact points at the, the units. So these are in, in, in DG Connect. So they, of course, the the formal part of the partnership is related to Horizon Europe. But DigiConnect is also running the digital uh, Europe program, so we have a direct link with them, and they are so very keen to get our input uh, on that, even though, I mean, there's no formal link between the partnership and, and digital Europe. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> anyway, we're, we are very uh, much um, pushed by the Commission to establish some collaborations with any uh, of the partnership. There are 49 partnerships running at the moment. Uh, in, in Europe, and there will be uh, some other, <coughs> but uh, uh, we are very much um, yes, pushed to, to create this um, collaboration 
and uh, common understanding with the other partnership, uh, the co-founded partnerships or, or joint uh, uh, undertakings. So um, we, we are part of uh, um, um, we are part of all the game. I mean, uh, of research, innovation, and uh, uh, deployment in, in Europe and digital Europe is is also as. Uh, uh, Kai was saying, uh, we are concerned by the EGIH uh, and the TEFs also, which are very much connected to uh, AI also and uh, all these applications. Consulting the membership, and uh, I don't know uh, the, all the criterions as uh, Thomas also, but uh, there are also different levels to participate with uh, ADRA. Uh, there is first, uh, you can collaborate in, uh, in, in the road mapping effort, and, uh, uh, because it's rather, rather open to, to everybody. Uh, you, you don't even need to be a member to, to also participate to this uh, road mapping effort. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, through Eurobotics or it's all the, the other associations. Uh, then there is the um, possibility to get some funding for the, for, from the Commission by of, of the, from, from the coal, from the open coal. This is another uh, specific issue. I think you need to have some, uh, uh, some legal uh, entity based in Europe to, to be part of that. That's the traditional roots. Uh, the ADRA is not inventing anything in that side. And uh, that's, that's basically what I can say in, uh, for this participation of the internationalization of ADRA. We're open to, uh, uh, to IDs and uh, sharing IDs with uh, other countries. And, but the key is anyway leveraging uh, the um, economy and research in Europe. That's the clear. Okay, I think that's a good statement too. And this, uh, this this panel. So thanks a lot to our panelists. <laughs> okay. So now we now we're going into the second part of this uh, session. So we invited a number of uh, uh, very interesting uh, speakers. Uh, so there will be uh, Mario uh, Acosta Ramirez from uh, CTAC. So he's a, a specialist in uh, uh, so he's a mechatronics engineer and with a focus on artificial intelligence, uh, vision, uh, robotics, and, and, uh, and AI. So we have Francois Goupil from from Scikit Learn, uh, who is a growth developer uh, there. Uh, so online we have uh, Louis Canta, who is the technical coordinator of the Confiance AI program. And uh, Denek Hanzelek, who is a professor uh, here at the Czech Technical uh, University. So they all present uh, 15 minutes or, well, 12 pin minutes, and then we have for, uh, a little bit uh, of time for questions. So, so I'd like to invite Mario to come to this stage. Hello, everyone. My name is Mario, as I said, just, and I'm, going I'm here to present a uh, little development that we did in Spain in the CTAG called uh, Vision Guided Robotic. In this case, uh, the idea is in the sense of a, a, a hyper-flexible factory. And in this case, we're using uh, AI or deep learning techniques in order to guide the robot in real time in order to, to, pre to perform robotic uh, operations on moving parts. I'm sorry. I think I'm going too fast. I don't know what. OK. I was pressing the wrong button. I'm sorry. All right. So as I said, my name is Maria Costa. I work in the CTAG, which stands for uh, Technology Center of Automotion in Galicia. I work in the Department of Advanced Processes, specifically in the area of computer vision and deep learning. We have a, our company is about a thousand employees big. Uh, we have a focus in automotive and uh, we work a lot with the factories in our region and of course with factories in Europe. And we're advancing to move to, towards uh, projects in collaboration with the US. Uh, our main techno technology fields are uh, factory 4.0 or factory of the future as, as we like to call it. We also do uh, product design and simulation, validation and testing, new materials, electronics, and passive safety. 
we are involved in all of the steps in the manufacturing of a car of in the automotive automotive industry and we have uh, quite the presence in Spain and in, the, in especially in Stellantis which is one of our clients so the context for this specific development was uh, basically the need of having a robotic system that was able to to adapt to changing environments for example if you have and a robotic operation that has to pick and place a part in an assembly line, and maybe that part is not always in the same position or moving in the same speed, how can you solve that with a traditional robot? Uh, there are solutions that use uh, 3D information and can give you a trajectory, but they do not work in real time. They are only giving you an approximation. So uh, the main focus was to create a process, uh, a system that could uh, solve the problem of, pro of process variation and of course that was uh, easy to configure and, to, and to, to set to work. As I said, the objective of this development was to develop a robotic system that can detect the surface of interest, to track it in real time, to respond to trajectory and speed variations and to offer ease of configuration and plus flexibility. Another thing that is important for us is to have a system that can be set up by a normal technician. It doesn't have to be a high level technician or a visual vision engineer in order to put this into a factory. Uh, of course, we start most of our developments as concepts or ideas. Uh, we take uh, ideas that goes from a theoretical level of one and then we try to develop them, develop them into a solution that can be, can be deployed in a factory environment. We of course have uh, a simulation, a laboratory in which we, we can simulate the factory environment and we can test our technologies there. And then we, when, we, when our technology is mature enough, we can move that and put it in, into a factory. That's why it's really important to have good collaboration with the factories in our region and in Europe, because of course, if we develop a new technology that we know that can be really useful for, for the industry, we need to test that factory, that, that technology in, in a real setting. Uh, in this specific case, this uh, system opened the doors for future developments. Uh, in the case of uh, solving automotion or, or automotion problems, and of course, is the interoperative interopera, in, I'm sorry, interoperation of factory lines. Uh, for this development, deep learning was really important because, as I said, the system is a robot that is guided in real time using vision, vision feedback from a camera. So if I were to have a false positive in my detection, the robot would move in, a, in an unexpected way and that could be dangerous for both the robot or the operators working in the line. So in order to have robust detection of our surface of interest, we used deep learning technologies. Of course, with deep learning, you have to uh, be wary that you need to, to get a huge amount of data in order to train your model and you have to have a, a fast way of performing your inference since this, since this has to run at real time, about 30 frames per second, so the inference time has to be small enough for the system to handle it. Uh, for the current state of the, of the technology, we developed a prototype, a working prototype that was tested in our facilities, uh, can I can I play the video? Here you can see our testing setup. We have a universal robot with the end effector that we designed, the application that we also developed, and this uh, demonstration was conducted in our own test facilities in our simulation of the factory. We have a moving flat platform in which we put sometimes in this case the the door but in other cases we put the whole car in the different uh, steps of the manufacturing process. And here you can see how the robot is able to look for the screw, adjust the position in real time, synchronize the movement of the robot with the door, and then uh, perform the operation. Here is the, the point of view of the application. 
as you can see, it's, it's really fast, it's reliable. The, the detection of the screw is quite robust. Uh, this is uh, uh, due to the inference methods we're using deep learning in order to uh, minimize the possibility of having a false positive. In this case, uh, uh, even as the screw can be really uh, consistent in, the, in its shape, uh, still you have the problems of uh, perspective or uh, distortion in the optic or even uh, shadows or, sh or shines in the part. So that can really pose a huge problem if you were to, to apply this technique with traditional 2D vision uh, techniques. And then the potential use cases. Of course, this uh, was tested with this specific use case. It was uh, uh, something that the client, uh, a problem that the client had in their, in their production. And they, they gave us this use case, but now that we have a complete proof of concept and we know that it, this technology works, we can uh, begin to imagine this solution working in different, different environments, such as assembly of different components, pick and place, quality assurance, uh, conformity assurance. Uh, basically, everywhere where you have a, a repetitive operation that's commonly uh, done by operators, and where you have a variation in your process, and that variation cannot be solved by a traditional robot solution. And finally, uh, the Junta de Galicia and the Gain uh, funded this development, and uh, we're here because of them, uh, so I want to say thanks. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Mario. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Anyone? Otherwise, I have one question. So in CTEC, I think it's a very interesting company. You're a, a, a lot of people specialized in, 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 in automotive. Uh, sorry, I have to stand here, otherwise <laughs> it <laughs> it's okay. makes noise. Um, uh, and this, uh, yeah, this uh, means AI data robotics uh, are, are there because I mean the three technologies are uh, are essential to to, to advance uh, in that sense. So within your company, do you do you have any mechanisms to create synergies between engineers that are working on on data topics, uh, maybe others on 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 robotics? Is there, are there any facilities for that or? Yes, we do. Specifically in the department that I work in, uh, we have uh, people from different fields. We have people from software, from robotics, from PLC programming. We have people that uh, does uh, 3D design. Uh, it's a multi, um, it's, a, it's a really, uh, I would say, uh, we have people of all backgrounds in order to have this kind of communication because, for example, if you were to ask a, someone that is an expert in something how to solve the, uh, an, a specific uh, problem, they are going to give you a solution within their fields. So if we have different people from different fields working in the same situations, we are going to have a new perspective on how to solve these kind of uh, problems in this case. Uh, it's really important to have people that know how to code, know how robots work, and of course how factory works in order to produce uh, solutions that are flexible enough for what I said, the idea of hyper-flexible factories. So yeah, it's really important to have uh, collaboration between the fields, and we do have uh, as I said, a laboratory that uh, we use to test all of these uh, ideas and technologies. We have a lot of equipment and uh, everyone works in the same line. So the sense of cooperation within the factories, within the company, I mean, it's, it's quite strong. Okay, thanks a lot, Ma Mario. Thank you. So the, a round of applause for Mario again. <laughs> Uh, so then I'd like to invite our next speaker, Fr François Goupil from Scikit-Learn. Okay. okay, so I'm going to present you Scikit-Learn a bit for those who don't know and maybe you will learn some uh, key facts or 
funny things about the library. And then I will move to, because the session is about automotive and mobility, I will move to something more specific because initially CycleTurn is very generic. It's a generic toolbox, but we will dig into automotive and mobility tools and how you can use uh, scikit-learn uh, regarding these topics. So the, the, before the creation of scikit-learn, and maybe it's still the case, it's not easy to have access to these three things, to large computing powers, to train ML experts, and to huge data sets. So the idea was to create a library uh, for the, like, making data science for for the many and not only the mighty. So the idea is that uh, you can do machine learning with CPUs, uh, with uh, small re computing resources, uh, not infinite data, and also without having an Ivy League uh, degree, for instance. And so what we created that in RIA is uh, the, the library scikit-learn. It was created uh, in 2009. So now this is a good uh, open source success story. Uh, it's uh, one of the top used uh, machine learning uh, library and why this success? Because we implemented it in Python, we package uh, it well, we maintain it, we have uh, huge contributions, uh, the API is really simple, it's well documented, you can find tutorials, examples, so it's, yeah, we put a lot of efforts on uh, exemplifying uh, how to use these machine learning algorithms and they are efficient so in terms of, uh, so we, we keep improve uh, this, this part, but uh, they are pretty, pretty efficient. So, okay. Yeah. And so INRIA is a French institute, so uh, Scikit-Learn is born in France, Python is born in the Netherlands, and what I want to say is that, in fact, we are talking about European machine learning, and it's something that not many people don't know, because so we are you know, Python plus scikit-learn equals European uh, machine learning, uh, and we would like to put, yeah, to, to put in even more the European DNA in the, in the library in the future, so we are open to, to partnerships uh, and to yeah, uh, European development ideas. Now it's um, the number seven Python project in terms of stargazers uh, in GitHub. Um, and uh, it's an industrial standard. Uh, so some survey, if you know Kaggle, there, there was a survey. I mean, every year they do a survey and uh, we often are the, the, the top one, uh, top framework um, used by the data scientists and 70% of them use it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so now let's dig into the automotive and mobility uh, industry part of things. So as I said, we document things, we do tutorials, uh, and we have one use case which is fleet management. So later on, I will put you, give you the link to a specific notebook, uh, and uh, this use case can be applied to. For I mean, it's useful for many actors. Imagine you are Uber or you are yeah, you are. You're renting some bikes in a city. Uh, you can use this uh, this use case. The idea is to predict uh, where to locate uh, your fleet. So it can be a fleet of anything. Here, this use case is uh, you. So you have data with mm, uh, weather conditions and business cycles. And what you want to do is to predict using so this specific method is gradient boosting uh, regression trees. And you want to predict uh, yeah, where to locate your bike, for instance. So if you scan this QR code, you can do the old tutorial and apply it with your own data. Uh, but you, we are doing even more uh, about uh, mobility. Uh, so it's just three examples of many of our users. So we have uh, hundreds of thousands of users uh, about for, for this library. Uh, these ones are French, uh, and they are very, very diverse. So, Telecom Paris Tech is a training, I mean, a, an academic institution, and we are giving a teaching there uh, in a smart mobility uh, master degree, for instance, teaching about scikit learns, and then they have many ideas to apply uh, the library to to this uh, to this use case. Michelin, so they, we have a consortium of sponsor because of, yeah, scikit learn is open source and it's free. But we need to, yeah, to leave. <laughs> so we have some sponsors. Michelin is probably going to be one. 
uh, and they have some, uh, so they're using the, the library to do some predictive maintenance, for instance. Uh, Keros is a startup, so you see like academic, uh, an industrial, and now a startup, which is a service, um, yeah, mobility service provider. So they are doing some matching uh, for uh, commuting people. So you, you commute to, from your home to workplace, you have a car, and, you, and other people is looking to do so, so you can share uh, the car. And they use scikit-learn, for instance, for, to help for the matching. We are uh, used by many, many other packages and repositories. So this is the number on GitHub you can find. So these packages and repositories depend on scikit-learn. And to give you an idea, we only depend on 10 other packages. And this is the number of packages that depend on us. So this is a good number. Uh, and we have a whole uh, scikit-learn uh, um, ecosystem because the API is really good. Many other projects develop uh, using the same API. And one of them is scikit-mobility. So scikit-mobility uh, can be used when you, have some, uh, when you want to do some human mobility uh, analytics. So they extend in the Pandas data frame, they created flows, data frames, trajectory data frames. And now you can do predictions uh, having these objects, Python objects, and use scikit-learn API then to predict some flows, predict some trajectories. And one nice also feature about scikit-mobility is that you can generate synthetic data uh, and then run simulations. So I encourage you to have a look to this uh, package, of course. And scikit-mobility, they created this because they, they said, okay, it's uh, yeah, paramount importance that we, uh, we have something to model these uh, human flows. And they, because there are many applications, so to name a few, uh, forecasting is one, but when you do want to do urban planning, managing your public transport uh, entity, you want to adapt the, the, your public transportation schedule or where to locate your, your offer, you can use uh, scikit-mobility and scikit-learn to do so. Uh, and yeah, when you, epidemic modeling, so we, it's a bit out of scope of this panel, but it can be used. Yeah, using these uh, modeling can also be applied to this kind of thing. And in the end, it's useful for policy makers, for industrial, for service mobility providers, for many different types of users. Well, I will skip maybe this, just to say that machine learning is important. Uh, it's also among the first uh, type of algorithms which are used, and not only deep neural networks are used, because you Sometimes you're not working with, you're working with images, for instance, you can have tabular data, and therefore then we are really good at working with tabular data or vectorized data. So what I want to say and to insist on again is that let us move with European machine learning so we can move with European machine learning. So when it comes to choosing between the among yeah, 10 different machine learning frameworks, I will recommend you to use scikit-learn one because it's yeah the more European sovereign wine, and we will put some effort to make it even more sovereign, and we want to spread this word that we want to make to stay sovereign. So we are really open to any <laughs> contribution in this regard. We have some sponsors, uh, diverse ones, so it's, mm, they are not giving any order, it's really like real sponsorship, uh, to name a few, here they are. We are currently running a session of a MOOC, which is free. You can scan this code if you want to join it. It's developed, maintained by core developers of the library. And it's yeah, good to, if you want to, to get into scikit-learn, I think it's the best uh, entry door. So yeah, some people are scanning it. I'm waiting a bit. <laughs> if it's not working, you can come and see me again <laughs> later on. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'm open to questions if you have some. Thanks a lot, Francois. So any questions on scikit-learn or Francois? Okay, just Kai. Thank you very much, Francois. As I 
told you yesterday. So here is one of the, one satisfied user of <laughs> your we uh, boosted the re regression trees and um, mm, my question is is if you for example look at the at the tensorflow the the google uh, library uh, framework uh, of course one advantage that google and others have is that they have a, a, a powerful cloud so you can uh, especially if you are using a computer uh, intensive algorithms you can then um, okay the, the tensorflow is also uh, you know more open source uh, but uh, if you want to use the compute then you have to pay for 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 the resources but uh, do you have some plans in a way to to pair this with some uh, cloud uh, cloud solution or to make it uh, i mean to handle the the in, uh, compute intensive tasks So that's a, a good question. Um, so we have different plans. One is the, to continue putting efforts on uh, preventing the fact that you need huge computing power to perform a prediction task. So we want to continue yeah, having a look to more frugal alt yeah, possibilities. The other is that we also want to stay competitive with other type of frameworks, TensorFlow being one. So we are also putting some efforts in uh, making sure first that we are running on GPU, so we are working with NVIDIA, we are working with Intel, and then we will be yeah, probably being able to run on cloud, GPU in the cloud, uh, and we know that if we want to, yeah, to, to continue to increase our user base uh, and deliver good machine learning, we will probably also have to, to go in this direction. Uh, but yeah. Again, in the meantime, if we can uh, reduce this usage would, would be also cool. <laughs> I don't know if it's answering your, your question. Yeah. yeah, okay. Hi, thank you for this presentation. My colleagues at TNO Data Science are also big fans of scikit-learn, so that's very good to hear. Um, I was wondering, I must confess that I didn't even realize that scikit-learn was a European development. I knew about Python, of course, but scikit-learn did not. Um, how deliberately are you trying to stay European? Or in maybe in other words, are you really looking at competition from other com continents and trying to face that competition explicitly? Or is it just, we work on a very good package and uh, that's what we do and well, it's fun that everybody likes us. So how explicit are you trying to position yourselves as a European development? Yeah, so that's, uh, again, thank you for your question because it's a way for me to clarify yes, this position. So when I say it's European machine learning, of course, we have contribution from all over the world, users from all over the world, and we think that this is the, the best story that can happen to us. And we are not willing to, yeah, to, make, uh, to get rid of this, of course. Uh, the thing is we want, so the, the, and uh, even among the core developers, so people having reviewing wise being able to merge code in the, the, the main code base, uh, some are also in the US, but most of them are in Europe. And that's why I'm saying that, uh, and it's born in, in, in Europe. That's why I'm saying it's European and we want to keep this going on. Because thanks to this um, European DNA, for the moment, we are also ab able to be yeah, quite free. I mean, uh, we're not depending on any other company, which is the case for, for other deep learning frameworks we just mentioned, for instance. Uh, so I think we we'll be really believe in, in this European B DNA because it will probably uh, make sure that we keep this freedom. And as developers, of course, we enjoy this because we then we also, in the end, really like to just yeah, deliver <laughs> the best machine learning we can do. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think my, my question ties the two ones, the, the previous ones, because I wanted to ask you, in terms of upscaling and also uh, European sovereignty, what about uh, a European HPC? 
because it's a big topic and uh, it can also be made accessible at least academic level because university join consorts and they ca can have access to these big machines. Do you see a path to, to also go for, for scikit on, uh, on high performance computing and especially in Europe, I would say? So I, I'm not an expert on HPC, um, but yes, again, uh, we're looking for European collaborations and if yeah, running applications on HPC is one, uh, we are open to it. Uh, I know that for, so I discussed with, I think it's IOC project, and they have some layers running machine learning to decide where to store the data among different types of storage to optimize the cost and the latency, for instance. So we could also maybe partner on these kind of topics. So uh, yeah, the answer is yes, we are, again, open to. <laughs> Discuss more about this. And, and, and only one comment, you know, says you Euro HP. That doesn't work, seem to work. Okay, so let me take the next one. Okay, Ooh, but also it's really working now. Uh, um, it says Euro HPC joint undertaking um, exactly facing this to have HPC capabilities in, in Europe available for, for applications. I make it general, could be research or industrial application. First of all, second issue, which I learned yesterday, on the top five um, uh, H most powerful HPC systems uh, worldwide, uh, two are from Europe, if I remember correctly. Uh, you have also here Carolina here in, in uh, uh, and Leonardo, I think, uh, um, uh, also only to give you a feeling and remember the situation some years ago, it was different. Um, and we, we as BDVA are a private member of the Euro HPC and exactly to place uh, application, we are not uh, development of HPC centers or something else, uh, but to ex uh, exactly to, to uh, place uh, application simulation or what else uh, in combination with the other partners in the Euro HPC joint undertaking. And uh, uh, HPC software stack, you know, we have the ETP for HPC um, um, association, which are taking more from the, um, close to the hardware uh, HPC uh, uh, software stack, and we are looking more on the application stack and applications. Okay, thanks a lot. So that, I think we had a very interesting dis dis discussion, but uh, yeah, we have to move on to the, the next speaker. So thanks again, Francois. Um, <laughs> So our next speaker will be joining um, uh, online, so Louis uh, Canta from the, so he's technical coordinator of the Confiance AI program. Louis, do you? Yes, I, I hear you, you need to stop sharing because I, I cannot share as long as you share. Okay, thanks. Tell me if you can see my screen. Yeah, we see it. So thanks uh, and sorry for, for being remote today. Uh, I, I will introduce you uh, uh, what we are doing in the program naming uh, Confiance.ai. Um, we, we want to uh, address the industrial challenge uh, of AI deployed in industrial critical system. Just what this program was uh, launched from a French initiative uh, called Grand Défi about uh, AI de confiance. And it was strongly promoted by AI manifesto member from the industry. And we are working in cooperation with uh, all the French AI hubs such as Anity, Dataia and other uh, uh, AI ecosystem. Uh, the program Confiance.ai is part of uh, a three pillar um, uh, answer to, to tackle the AI, uh, the trust of AI. One is around how we um, build norm standard and regulation uh, around uh, trust of AI. One is around how we make evaluation and uh, especially in uh, automotive uh, part. And we are tackling the technological pillar, which is uh, uh, designed to, to provide tools and methods in order to help design, deployment, and maintenance of AI critical systems. 
In one word, uh, industry asks us to provide solutions to help them uh, adapt their engineering frameworks to uh, answer transfer AI. So what are the challenges? Uh, the, the main challenge is it's a multi-technology, multi-domain and multi-engineering challenge. We have seven kinds of AI. Uh, just before we, 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 we have a presentation of scikit-learn, which we use in some of our use case, which is one type of AI answer and AI framework. We also have data-based um, and um, deep learning uh, based uh, AI uh, solution that we, we have to, to, to integrate in our framework. We have hybrid AI, which, um, which is several kinds of AI inside one, and also distributed and embedded AI. To answer all this kind of AI component we want to integrate in our system, we have to adapt a different kind of engineering. It have impact on data engineering and knowledge engineering, algorithm engineering, but also system engineering. We could not design systems the way we used to design them in the past uh, if we want to integrate AI components inside. And then at the, the last part is how we adapt all these methods and tools to the different industrial domain uh, that we, we want to address. So to, to build this project, we have nine industrial partners, four RTO, and uh, I will pr present at the end several key features. What is the scientific challenge? Uh, as I start to, to introduce it, it was an um, engineering challenge. So how we adapt the global approach of trustworthy AI component designs. Uh, what is the new activity that, that has to be added inside the workflow of designing an industrial system integrating uh, component AI? How do I qualify them? How do I build embeddability of AI? We have um, human interaction, interaction uh, challenge uh, uh, focus with two um, point of view. The one which is directed to the user of the uh, AI-based system, and the one which is dedicated to designer and certifier um, uh, user um, for questions such as how do we use explainability uh, answer, how do we use the how do we understand the property we build on our system to demonstrate robustness or, or of a challenge? And the last one, which is um, mainly the new one in uh, AI uh, system uh, design, is the, the one which is focused around data. Uh, how do we build data sets? What is a Good data set for uh, what is what is a good data because data set is uh, just a, a way to, to tackle the thing. How do we build them? How we, do we maintain them? How do we assess the quality and um, the completeness and the representativeness of, of the data we are managing inside our system? But not only from a point of view of development, but from the, all the life cycle. So from the initiation of the system to the maintenance in the life cycle at the end. So how do we handle all this challenge? Uh, the program has been split inside seven projects. Um, four projects which will tackle dedicated problem. Uh, one which we, which not will, but is tackling the data and knowledge problems. So uh, all the life cycle for managing uh, the data from the de definition of operational domain, uh, which is well known in uh, automotive industry, which is ODD. So how can I start with an ODD and end it with a lot of data managed all the, in, during all the life cycle? The second project, which will tackle specific challenge around how do I design AI algorithm, which will by design have some trustworthy property. The third one, which is how once uh, AI component is designed, I make evaluation of it uh, based on which metrics, which, which property, robustness, explainability, monitoring, 
and, and a lot of them. And the last one is how once I have an AI system designed, how do how can I preserve the property developed uh, once embedded inside my system? So around these four projects, which tackle very, very specific um, challenge, I have three projects which uh, aggregate all these results inside one trustrophy environment. One which is uh, focused on methodology and which will integrate all the adaptation of methodology that, sh that shall be applied for the whole life cycle of engineering developments. One which is focusing about the VVQ um, uh, part of this uh, cycle, uh, to not only, uh, for example, Asura's case, how do I demonstrate uh, uh, local robustness of, uh, of an algorithm, how um, ex explainability uh, properties such as which pixel uh, is used to de determine uh, one decision. How do I use this local property uh, in my demonstration of safety? And then the last one is an integrative project, which is how do I integrate all these methods and tools in, inside an end-to-end -end methodology and um, environment in order to develop my system. So how we start, we start two years ago, and we have an incremental strategy uh, based on different kind of AI. So first data driver, then data and knowledge, and uh, next year we'll start with uh, hybrid AI. With different kind of uh, use case, uh, time series and image on the first year, text, audio, second years, and we will integrate next year hybrid uh, use case and also increasing uh, criticality in, uh, in our uh, compliance research uh, from, our, from our partners. Uh, what I can add here is that we deliver each year one version of the environment with a set of tools and methods that can be start to be applied uh, in the environment of our partner and we get the feedback from the previous version to improve, adapt, or um, extend the roadmap of the year uh, after. Um, we, we do not just work on methodology and tools. Uh, we, we want to demonstrate that these methodology and tools can really answer real industrial use case problem. So in this slide, you have all the use cases integrated with two first years of the program. For each of um, kind of AI problem we want to tackle inside the program. So for example, we have 2D vision problem, we have vision, visual inspection problem, we have a time series prediction from, uh, we have anomaly detection. So for each kind of AI problem we want to tackle, we are identify one or uh, preferably two use cases to evaluate how the method and tools we are developing can answer uh, the industrial question of trust of it. If, if I just take one example, I will not be able to, 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 to detail all of them, but maybe are, if you have questions afterwards, I will, I will go deeper in, in some of the use cases. Uh, if I take the welding inspection, uh, which is uh, provided by Renault. Uh, the question was, OK, I have a good algorithm, deep algorithm, deep learning algorithm to detect uh, which is a good and uh, welding. But how do I demonstrate to my industrial um, boss that I can integrate this inside my process and preserve security of my car? And we do not have answer at the beginning. And so we, we, it's not just a rob local robustness. So it's not just because I can demonstrate that uh, if I uh, add blur on my image, uh, I do not change the decision. It's, so it's just not an explainability answer, which is a pixel which on this image can contribute to the decision. It's not just uh, uh, how many data you have. 
It's how you integrate all these steps, uh, artifact in the demonstration, uh, that can lead you to uh, extend the trust in the system for all the shareholders uh, in the engineering processing. So, uh, from all these use cases, we are uh, projecting uh, in an engineering framework all the tools and methods. So, you have just here a simplified version about the workflow we, we, we are using with uh, data engineering, ML design, evaluation, implementation. You, you can see some redundancy with, or at least some linked with uh, the project uh, organization, but also the link in the interaction between all these activities. And from all this um, engineering and um, uh, methods, we map all the tools and methods we are developing inside the program to answer part of the, of the question on each of these activities. So you have here what was delivered last year, so end of the first year of the program, which is uh, integration of um, last year, it was 30 components. We will have this year more than 100 components and methods which will be integrated inside the environment, a group inside four um, main uh, platform which will tackle robustness, which will tackle explainability, which will tackle monitoring, and data engineering. So all, all of this is grouped in four, in four uh, platforms this year and integrated in a global methodology. Just to, uh, to, to, to make a, a step back, we have at the beginning nine large groups uh, for RTO, but in the last two years, we also integrate a lot and a lot of other contribution so from academics uh, partner through uh, an IME, we, we launched one year and a half ago with startups, which integrate their tool inside our environment. We have 11 startups which just integrate and evaluate their tools inside the environment and how their tools and methods can improve uh, the trustworthy of AI system inside the, the development. And we also work on standard and So up to now, we have more than 43 partners joining uh, the program. And the last focus I want, uh, maybe on the question, I will go back on one of the different elements. But the last focus I want to, to introduce here is our relation with standardization and certification landscape. So inside the Grand Defi, Confiance has a goal to develop tools and methods in relation with uh, 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 pillar three, which is around strategy of, the, of standardization uh, around AI uh, in France. And from this collaboration, we strongly contribute to two new work group items inside the Sense and Elec, uh, which focus two very important um, elements in our, in, in our view is how would we define high-level specification metrics and control for trustworthiness in AI? So which will be the property and the metrics that we will have to define and monitor during the AI design system? And the second one is how we can build an AI risk catalog and risk assessment. So how do we manage the risk associated to the AI? So all the outputs of AI, uh, Confiance.ai program, it's is uh, strongly related to, to these two uh, working groups. So we, we provide input for this, these two working groups. And it is also in, a, in, um, in collaboration with uh, Germany, uh, but not only. And we have also uh, initiative about uh, labelization of AI in interaction with AI Act initiative. So all this uh, output of method and tools and um, trust of the property is just uh, an input we, we want, we, we are providing 
to to all the initiative to to provide uh, methods and tools in Europe to answer the, uh, the um, uh, data AI act. So that's that's all for now. Maybe just several key features to 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 give you about the program. So it's a four-year program, please. nine Lo groups. Loic. Oui, yes. So, so can I can I ask you to wrap up, please? Sorry. Can I ask you to wrap up, please? to finish the presentation. Yeah, the it's, it's the last slide. So okay, it's finished. Good. Thank you. So just a key figure. Uh, 300 people, two main sites and 45 million budget. So it's, it's, it's completed for me. OK, so thanks a lot, uh, Loïc. <laughs> so a any questions for Loïc? Okay, so I have, I have one of, of myself, a, qu a quick one. So, so I, I see European or international collaboration, at least on the standardization uh, effort with the Confiance AI program. Uh, are there any other uh, European links to Confiance AI or maybe an exchange of, 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 of uh, yeah, platform tools? Is this something you're, you're thinking about as well? Um, uh, for now, we, we do not have, uh, we, we have initiated a uh, discussion with uh, um, Germany on uh, European basis, but there's nothing start right now. Uh, but from this project, we are integrated inside several European uh, uh, project, which will in which one we will integrate these outputs um, because most of the work is uh, has to be shared. So it will be shared inside uh, several European project. But we are also open to uh, collaboration. Okay, so th thanks again, uh, Loïc. Um, so the next speaker uh, of this and the last speaker of the session is um, Denek Anzelek, who is a professor at the uh, Czech, uh, Czech Technical University in, in, in Prague. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. So may I ask you for the video first? Uh, so today I will speak about uh, two uh, uh, use cases. The first one uh, is uh, well adapted for university, uh, where you have uh, scaled down uh, formula car, uh, and uh, you compete with the other university teams in so-called uh, Formula One tenth competition. So the objective is to go as fast as possible around the lab. Uh, uh, the, uh, the competition is uh, typically associated with some robotics uh, conference uh, and uh, you have predefined setting like uh, hardware mechanics of the formula and sensors uh, so that you really need to compete with algorithms, right? Maybe uh, uh, the second use case is uh, what we have done in collaboration with uh, Porsche Engineering, uh, where I worked uh, uh, for several years as a head of uh, software development department, uh, uh, and uh, the objective uh, was to replace uh, um, uh, replace a test driver, which does the so-called slalom test. Uh, uh, and uh, the objective was to make it reproducible because uh, if you make a software upgrade uh, and then another uh, driver uh, takes it, uh, then you may obtain different results. Okay, so so please start my presentation now. And uh, so uh, that's here. Uh, uh, so I already uh, said uh, what is my presentation about, uh, two use cases and some mentions about the tools and platforms we are using. Uh, so, so this is uh, the scenario of uh, um, Formula One tense competition. Uh, it's battle of algorithms, so everybody has the same hardware. There is a relatively easy way to construct the car from predefined uh, from predefined components. Uh, and the objective is to use uh, LIDAR and camera uh, in two types of disciplines. Uh, one is a timed race, uh, where the fastest uh, lap is uh, measured uh, for you to compete with the other teams. And the second one is head-to-head -head race, uh, where you have to also overtake uh, the other partners. So, by the way, we have uh, won the first place in Porto. Uh, uh, it was in 2017. Uh, and we have organized also one competition in Prague associated with IROS conference last year. Uh, 
So, uh, so that's uh, that's what you do. You you observe uh, the boundaries uh, of the of the track, uh, and uh, uh, you may use lidar and camera, and you plan trajectory, and you keep uh, keep that trajectory. Uh. Uh, so the advantage for for, uh, for 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 university is that it's in controlled environment. Uh, there is no danger that uh, anybody will be killed, like with a real car. It's not very expensive. Uh, there is this competition aspect, so students can compare their solution with other students from other universities. Uh, the competition is organized by University of Pennsylvania, so you have teams from well well-ranked universities which have uh, many resources and big teams, uh, so it's really quite challenging. Uh. And it's uh, very student-friendly, um, everybody can put it on his desk, uh, it's not so big. Uh, uh, there are experiments, uh, uh, so you can close, let's say, development cycles starting from design, implementation and tests and then redesign and so on. And there are many subtasks, on, for example, trajectory planning is our favorite task, which uh, goes closer to optimization mathematics and so on, huh? and control and uh, localization and uh, AI uh, in uh, whatever, uh, whatever form you want. Huh? So, so this is, for example, our trajectory planning algorithm based on genetic algorithms when we uh, partition the lab into segments and we, uh, by genetic algorithm, we decide about so-called waypoints uh, and then we, uh, we, we make trajectory through these waypoints, we evaluate uh, by simulation, we evaluate uh, how, how much time it takes uh, to make a lab and then we compare it with other, uh, other uh, chromosomes uh, that provide different solutions. Okay, so and then by implementing different algorithms, you obtain different solutions. So these are, for example, measurements from some experiments where we have, in addition, uh, put uh, some obstacles on on the track uh, so that the task is a bit more difficult. Uh, and the algorithm has also to decide whether to go from the left or right side of the obstacle. And then you have different algorithms, and they have different properties, and you try to make the best one. Okay, so that was the first use case. The second use case is about the slalom. So you have a car. Uh, we have been uh, allowed to mount additional sensors, namely a differential GPS uh, camera and lidar on the top of uh, Porsche Panamera. And you also use uh, sensors that are built in the car via flex ray. Uh, you obtain very precise and uh, time deterministic measurements of uh, different, uh, different physical, physical parameters. Um, and uh, we also use the, the same the same hardware like in Formula One tens. It means Nvidia TX2 board with uh, ROS, and uh, also the sensor set is uh, very similar to the use case uh, for students. Uh, and the, the main tasks are detect to detect uh, uh, cones by camera, to fuse different data from different sensors, namely lidar and camera, to plan trajectory, uh, and to to keep uh, trajectory. And of course, you have to interface uh, the control system to uh, to the car itself, uh, which is uh, kind of a tricky uh, problem because you need to uh, somehow convince the control units in the car that uh, the signals that you send over flex ray they should accept and, and, and to, 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 to keep going, right? Okay, so, so there are many engineering problems. For example, when the wet is soil, uh, soil is wet, uh, then uh, lidar doesn't work because uh, the laser um, ray uh, does not uh, reflect back. Uh, uh, another problem is if you have, for example, 16 ray lidar, like in our case, uh, then you can easily miss a cone which is like 100 meters distant, for example. You have a fisheye distortion of image uh, when you use camera. So even though the, the, the cones are relatively big, like half a meter, uh, still they are relatively small on the image and when you fuse data between the two, it's not so easy to detect uh, in which distance uh, the cone is. Uh. So this is functional diagram. Uh, let me go quickly. So you have some some sensors. Uh, then you detect uh, detect uh, the cone. Uh, you do several measurements. So you finally you obtain a map of cones, uh, which uh, highest likelihood that the cones are really on those positions. On the other hand, you have to uh, you have to know position of your car. Therefore, you use a differential GPS and also odometry from from the car sensors, and and then you can perform trajectory planning because you know position 
position of the car and you know position of cones, so you plan trajectory and you keep a car on that trajectory and via flex ray you, you control uh, longitudinal movement uh, by autonomous cruise control and uh, lateral movement by uh, intelligent parking assistant EQ in a car. Okay, so these are like some images uh, from our experiments at Strahov. Strahov is a famous student dormitory here in Prague. Uh, if you look on the Strahov Hill, you can even see it from here. So you see that when you want to detect, for example, the cones, you can also detect many other objects that are very close to it, uh, like a face of the person or some some rear rear uh, lights of the cars and so on. Uh, so so we have detected uh, some regions of interest, uh, then we use the Hawk classifier and uh, a support vector machine to, uh, to distinguish uh, cones from non-cones. Uh, and uh, that was the way to detect uh, the cones and also you have to localize them in, in the image and, uh, and harmonize what you see uh, between uh, uh, leader and camera. And once you know in which position the cone is in, uh, um, in the leader view, then you can measure the distance uh, if apparently some of the rays is really, it's really tucking the cone. Okay? Another problem was with position uh, uh, because uh, the differential GPS doesn't work properly always. Sometimes you lose the signal and then you need to have a Kalman filter which also uh, takes information from odometry of the car so that you can uh, keep uh, the, the position which is more likely than the one that you get from the GPS. Huh? And the other problem is that you need also to know the heading of the car, not only like a fixed point but also like a vector, let's say, of, of movements of the car. Um, you do not have from differential GPS any measurements for that, uh, but uh, from sampling uh, uh, over let's say two and a half meters movements of the car you can deduce by Kalman filter and kinematic properties of the car uh, what is what is the heading uh, quite appropriately uh, okay so so different engineering problem you solve uh, like trajectory planning uh, I don't think we have uh, time to, to go into details so this is like optimization problem when you try to find the best possible solution of uh, uh, locations of uh, so-called waypoints through which you go uh, and uh, and then uh, you need to uh, use a uh, uh, kind of uh, control engineering approach how to go most efficiently from one waypoint to another waypoint uh, while doing it as, as fast as possible with a minimum jerk uh, and uh, with a minimum acceleration, acceleration in order to, let's say, minimize uh, energy consumption, right? So, and finally, you can simulate it for, for different types of uh, cone positions. For example, if they are in line, or if, and you do symmetric U-turns, uh, if they are in line and you do asymmetric U-turns, if they are dispersed in a, in a plane and you do asymmetric U-turns, you, you obtain different functions. Uh, you can simulate it in ROS, for example. Uh, this is where we have done it, right? So now I go to, to the last uh, three slides. Uh, one is about ROS, uh, which is kind of ROS operating system, uh, but in fact it's not operating system, it's a software and framework for robotic application, which is very popular. So on the bottom you have uh, some uh, some time deterministic middleware for uh, the case of ROS2. Uh, then you have many libraries that are uh, containing many uh, robotic uh, algorithms uh, and you have uh, also many development tools that help you, for example, to visualize, uh, uh, to, to measure and so on. Okay, So this is very very friendly open source uh, environment uh, which is widely used uh, uh, namely in academia but also some companies are using more and more extensively this thing. And the problem they have is, like, let's say, maturity of ROS, uh, and this is why uh, the, the initiative has started several years ago, which is called ROS2, uh, which objective is to uh, have a redesigned <coughs> internal architecture so that uh, it's um, better quality uh, and architecture code, uh, better performance, and also real-time support uh, of, of the new ROS. Okay, so, so now we are moving our applications from ROS1 to ROS2. This is actually what we do for about uh, two years already. 
so we, we do it for our uh, for our student competition but also for our collaboration with uh, with Porsche where we have <coughs> Porsche Cayenne and uh, we develop a kind of uh, so called to flex lay to Ross uh, to uh, bridge uh, and uh, currently uh, we uh, we have a small small task of so called uh, uh, autonomous lane keeping assistant uh, for uh, for Porsche Cayenne so this is like shown here for that purpose we also use simulation in one minute simulation in Carla uh, which maybe you use as well uh, the project is about certification of uh, ALKS uh, that we do with uh, TFC uh, uh, in some uh, Czech uh, project here and uh, the last thing is uh, this, uh, our exp about our experiments with LIDAR uh, in some Prague street where we use uh, Livox LIDAR which has some non-repeating scanning patterns uh, uh, to, to, to uh, to have like more dense uh, measurements of the distances of objects. Uh, so these are like uh, experiments that we have done two weeks ago. Okay, that's it. Huh? Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Danek. Any questions for Danek? Quick ones. So, so I have one. Um, so I have one question. Uh, so, so, so to implement the use cases, uh, the, the, the competitions uh, you, you mentioned, it seems you need a lot of different expertise to, to, to get there. Can you give some insight in your team? What type of people are working uh, with you? Yes, in fact, we, uh, I teach in two different programs. Uh, one is called Cybernetics and Robotics, uh, where they have some knowledge of hardware, let's say real-time properties of hardware, um, very good knowledge of control, like classical control disciplines, uh, and uh, some of cybernetics and AI. And the second program is uh, so-called open informatics, which are like classical computer scientists, uh, and where there is like dedicated uh, uh, part of this program for for AI. So so they are taught in computer vision, in uh, data science, in in, in these uh, AI algorithms. So so these are two qualifications we have. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's also interesting to look on, let's like, say, uh, mechanical engineering aspects, for example, in this case, so like friction uh, of tires, uh, if you do the slide slip and so on. But, but these are typically the qualifications we need. Uh, but in Prague, you have relatively many uh, development companies, if you can name Valeo, Porsche Engineering, ZF, and I don't know, maybe we will find 10 different companies that have, let's say, like lower hundreds, uh, lower hundreds of, uh, of development engineers in this area. Not, not only for automated driving, of course, but for, let's say, classical for example chassis stability problems and so on so 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 i think it's good a good education for our students and now they find very good jobs in in these companies so. okay, great. thanks a lot uh, Danek. please please stay Danek. so we're starting the panel uh, so we're finalizing with our panels i'd like to invite the speakers uh, uh, on stage once more So we have uh, maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes, about. So I think uh, it was very enlightening to, 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 they were very diverse, our presentations, but, but uh, they related to, or your presentation related to the, to the automotive and the mobility from different perspectives. Uh, so one question that that uh, stay here uh, that uh, I think is central for for the whole discussion here, also relating to to the Adra discussion at the beginning, is the uh, the how you see the convergence now between these three legs, the AI data and, and robotics. I mean, uh, of course, on on the high level, uh, there is a clear strategic. Uh, uh, importance there, but uh, if you're thinking about your concrete work in in the labs and uh, and uh, and in your uh, in, in your daily work, uh, how do do you see that there really is a, a, 
this uh, convergence is, is in a way being realized and are there some problems there on the way. So maybe we go just, uh, you, if you start, uh, Maria, there and then we go step by step. Yeah. And, yeah. All right, so in my personal experience, I believe that there are problems that cannot be solved with the traditional methods that we have been used in these past years. I believe that uh, with uh, intelligence, with that artificial intelligence and modern uh, systems, we will be able to open the opportunities to solve problems that couldn't be solved in the past. And also this is going to allow us to move forward, into, to move faster into new technologies and new fields. So yes, I, mm. I believe that the convergence of these technologies is a must if we want to move forward in a technology aspect of seeing the things. So speaking of convergence, so I think, uh, yeah, so second law would be AI, so convergence with data and robotics. So with data, um, we want to investigate uh, and extend uh, the work of scikit-learn to work on data interoperability, working with uh, W3C standards, for instance, uh, working with ontology, improve these works also around ontologies and see if we can do something. So I think, I hope from this work, some convergence with the data world will arise. Mm. Uh, with robotics, uh, I've seen, for instance, uh, SVMs uh, used uh, on the previous work. Um, and I think we should, so Scikit-learn is also showcasing a lot of things in the, the documentation and examples. I think we have very few examples and we, we are s scarcely showcasing uh, use cases in robotics. So I think it could be one convergence possible uh, showing that what is possible to, to do with machine learning and, and a robot. Um, mm. Mm. And in terms of challenges, because you also mm. asked the question. So we have some challenges about privacy. Uh, privacy of, for instance, we spoke about mobility data uh, and I think if the data world also could help us uh, working on the, the privacy. Uh, so I mentioned psychic mobility in my presentation. You can have some home work attacks on these kind of data sets. Uh, so we could think about yeah, how to, to patch uh, these problems for instance, mm. just to give an, an example. Mm. Okay, so I would a little bit like to complain about the complexity which we are facing here. Mm. For example, mm. 10 years ago where we were supposed to, to set up some algorithm, it took me like two months to, to have like basic working uh, stuff. Uh, nowadays with AI it takes like three, three times more. I don't know why, mm. but the things are extremely complex. Uh, mm. So the interfaces are like really tough to understand sometimes. And you also need to merge together several disciplines as, mm. as you have mentioned, right? So, mm. so, so it uh, takes a lot of time to, 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 mm. to realize the experiment, to, 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 to well understand what is really needed to do. And uh, I think this is one of the dangers uh, of our discipline because computer science is not very major in engineering sense. Uh, for mm. example, if you look on mechanical engineers, one engineer does the drawing and the second engineer takes a machine tool and makes a piece. Uh, mm. Can you imagine that in software engineering that I will tell you what you are supposed to realize and you mm. realize exactly what I said? Uh, mm. It's uh, impossible. Right? Mm. So, so, so it's not very major. It's not like Lego that you would really put the blocks together and everything worked. Uh, there are many dangers like, for example, let me name just security. Uh, you have new security patch uh, every, uh, every second week and then what worked last week doesn't work today and so on. So, so it's not really easy. Like it's, it's, it's a little bit messy, uh, very, very challenging, very moving ahead, but also very difficult to realize. <laughs> Loic, please. Yeah, maybe on, on the same side, I'm, I'm sharing that uh, AI definitely need to be used on new system because we, 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 we it tackles some problem that we could not tackle otherwise. Uh, from the challenge we have, I think the first one is cultural because the world has not the same meaning in the different community that have to collaborate around this system. I just take, for example, the world of certifi certified. 
If I discuss in AI community, people tell me how I can certify the neural network. It just means that I can demonstrate that for one kind of perturbation, it is robust <laughs> on one image. If I discuss with people from automotive or aeronautic industry, uh, certification of a component has, do, has definitely not the same meaning. So there's a cultural and um, uh, discussion between all the parts that has to be to be complete. And for the interaction between data and robotics, I think robotics have a huge experience in simulation environment, how to simulate, and we shall use it uh, to evaluate AI. And from the data perspective, we shall use all the accountability processes to manage the data uh, in, the life, uh, in the life cycle uh, from uh, the collection of the data from the privacy and all the accountability managing of the history uh, of the, the change of the version of the data shall be, shall be shared from all the data, um, uh, data parts. So robotics, data, and AI shall definitely collaborate to, 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 to build system. Yeah. Thank you. That was encouraging from the, that uh, other obviously is other type of, of uh, collaboration is needed. So uh, uh, digging a bit deeper into this, uh, so we heard that these uh, technologies are, are, are used already for route planning, autonomous driving. Uh, uh, that uh, Denik. Uh, told us very well. Uh, do you think that if we are thinking about the best practices that you have obtained in your work uh, relating to this, uh, to the mobility and uh, auto automatic driving, is there anything that you can, other sectors could learn from you? Uh, and uh, and um, that is one thing. And uh, maybe the other thing is if you go, want to go forward even deeper in the in the con uh, utilizing the convergence, what could that be uh, in, in your? So the first one is really the how, how is something for for the, for the neighbors <laughs> to learn, and the other other is 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 okay. You, you want still to develop in your own sector. All right. So in my own experience, I believe that sometimes we use these technologies in order to solve the problems that we currently have in the factories or in our, or in our laboratories. And that's a good practice, but now that we have these uh, powerful tools and we have this process, for example, if we were to speak about uh, deep learning or uh, computer vision uh, 20 years ago, we were speaking about the computers that we had available in those times, which uh, weren't very powerful if you compare them to what we have today. So I believe that if we can use these tools uh, in conjunction with the powerful hardware that we have right now, we can uh, both solve the problems that we have right now, and then we can explore new ways to do new stuff in the future, for example, autonomous driving or uh, vision-guided robotics, which is a kind of a niche uh, sector of the robotic uh, in, uh, field. So yes, I, I believe that uh, it's, it's good if we focus our attention in solving the problems that we have today, but it's better if we try to apply this uh, these technologies to create new perspectives to, to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I don't have this uh, very... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a daily basis on a generic uh, mm -hmm. machine learning, so I don't know much about what the neighbors can learn from the others. But from my perspective, with what is nice in the into automotive and mobility industry is that uh, automotive has a huge uh, knowledge in terms of uh, industry, like it's very yeah, industrial, so I think they are way ahead on predictive maintenance and stuff like this and mm. very sensitive to these uh, problems and uh, yeah, I've um, already started to implement it on production lines uh, and uh, on the mobility side it's uh, a field where services are rising a lot and I think uh, then it can inspire all the other services um, industries, mm. uh, if I can mix the two words. But uh, so, so I'm sure uh, yeah, inspiration is there. Uh, yeah. And let's hope that uh, yeah, <laughs> we can, ADRA can contribute to, mm. to this. 
Thank you. So, so when we look on classical automated cars, like for example Tesla does, uh, it's amazing. Uh, there is uh, definitely a lot of know-how, but this know-how is not shared with the others, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's a difficult question how to step in. Uh, if you are, for example, in academia, uh, uh, already the control unit of the car is a relatively complex thing, and you cannot just uh, reverse engineer everything to make it move, right? Mm -hmm. So, so. The problem is really openness. So, so there is a lot of research uh, which is done privately. It's okay. Uh, we have uh, the products, but we are just in a position of users. Huh? We are just supposed to pay for, for a car and then use it and maybe to report some mistakes. Huh? Mm. Um, which is and, and it's closed, right? So, so it's very difficult to step in. I understand why it's closed. Huh? That's obvious. Uh, but the question is what the research and academia should do to just be part of that game, right? Mm. And the similar similar cases, for example, in uh, in process automation or in uh, production, where we use, for example, process simulate from Siemens to uh, to use make digital twins of uh, let's say KUKA robots, uh, for example, and then you need to buy process simulate. Uh, you need to buy a controller of a specific uh, KUKA robot for that process simulate, so that you can, for example, have really a really nice uh, timely model of of the robot. And if you want to interface your software uh, with that, for example, we did optimization of energy uh, for robotic welding, uh, then there is no documented uh, interface so that you can interact um, uh, with uh, uh, with this system. Okay. Mm. So so again, it's about reverse engineering how it really works, uh, what it is here and when they change the version maybe uh, you need to do it uh, again uh, because uh, you have lost uh, mm. the interface because there is no guarantee that the interface mm. will be kept so um, and on the other hand you cannot develop process simulate yourself because there is a lot of know-how and uh, this is a 3d environment with all the graphics and all the know-how in robotics and process mm. engineering so 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 it's a question how to go further right whether for example associations like adra can maybe a little bit stress more the need for for standardization and, and so on right so yeah. that, that, that would be really welcome huh? yeah thanks Good. Yeah, may maybe uh, I completely agree on this side. Interoperability, interoperability and collaboration between the, the different uh, uh, party where AI has to be integrated is, is, a, is an enabler, a key enabler of, uh, of the future and associations such as Altra can contribute. Uh, on this side, um, from, from our point of view, uh, we, we still have a huge challenge on how to integrate AI inside the usual way to develop system. Uh, um, I think we are now in the same place we were just 30 years ago with software, which was a new kind of thing that helped to design system. So at the first time, we just uh, put some line of code inside uh, electronics, and it's just a new way to make electronics. Mm. And I think when we are discussing AI today, it's quite the same challenge. We, we integrate new component based on data, learn from data, and it's like it, it, it will be in the next years like software. You will have hardware, software, data, which contribute to, to, to your systems. And you, you have to well understand how to uh, couple and how to, to make interaction between all these fields. And we do not know yet exactly how to do. We have learned of software in software the, the, the 30 last years. Mm. And we still have to build the process and the new, uh, also the new, uh, the new jobs, the new position. Uh, we, we discussed about, oh, I want a software guy in 20 years ago. Now we have people who make specification, we make tests, we make algorithm, with architecture, we have different kind of people who interact in the software system. And we still have to build this for, for AI and, and how to interact with the other. Thank you, very good point. Maybe we had, had space for one question from the audience. If there are anything that you have <laughs> at this <laughs> end of a long session, two hours, is there any anybody? If not, I think uh, in the reason of time that we, we thank the the panelists and uh, also Joost for <laughs> for uh, arranging this. I think I'm very interested and. Uh, 
panel that uh, when we talk about the convert, also the, I think the discussion here converge a bit, and uh, and at least to Adra we will take uh, your points uh, with us and uh, and uh, have them to impact how we think. Thank you very much, and then we go for coffee, I suppose. <laughs>